the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I, I guess you're probably wondering, how am I going to preach on the most awful story of the beheading of John the Baptist? Well, I'm not. <laughs> uh, it's a part of our history, and I must tell you that there, uh, there was a lot of intrigue and and machinations going on in the palace in the time of Jesus, as there has been right straight through history. So we ought not to be shocked and surprised about it. The reason the story is told, of course, is because just as we saw last week, there's a lot of question about who is Jesus? Who is he? Is he just a prophet? Is he somebody, is, is he somebody who's come back from the dead? Is he the Messiah? Who is he? And this will go on for the next several weeks as we seek to answer that question. But this morning, we're going to have a conversation about something else. What is your responsibility as Christians who come to church every Sunday? I want to talk about that theologically, I want to talk about that liturgically, and I want to talk about that practically. And I'm going to be brief. I want to, I want to give you a lesson in what your responsibility is when you come to church. Now, I want you to take notes on this. There's space in the bulletin for notes. Take notes and mark these things down. There will be a test. <laughs> and it will be next Sunday. You know how I've emphasized the business of amen. And I'll continue to do that, so you might as well get used to it. Just give me a good, strong amen at the end of prayers or at the end of a blessing, I'll be satisfied. But why is that? It has to do theologically with who you are as a member of Christ's body. You are a royal priesthood. That's what St. Peter said. By being baptized into Christ, we are baptized into, we are joined with, Christ's high priesthood. We are made priests with him. Now we use the word priest for a person who usually presides at the Eucharist, and that's right and good. But that's not the only priest. In fact, that priesthood is more practical in nature. I like to tell the couples I used to, when I used to do weddings, I said, you know who the ministers of the marriage are? And they'd say, well, you say, no, it's you, the man and the woman. Only you can make the pledges you make to each other. So what's the priest there for? To get your lines straight. <laughs> to get the words right and to get everything done in order. I'm a technician. I am presiding, but I'm not doing magic. It is our prayer together as the holy priesthood in Christ that makes this place holy and the sacrament effective. I want you to understand that that's the most important thing of all. You are members of a royal priesthood. That's why amen is so important. You're saying, I'm with you. That's my prayer. That's where I stand. Whenever we say amen, we shouldn't say it like, amen. Get it over with. We should say, Amen. That's me. I'm with you. I stand with Christ. Now, that's the theology. The liturgy is the second point this morning. Take your prayer book. I know this is foreign. <laughs> when I was... Uh, uh, the diocesan bishop, I always tried to uh, discourage people from these one pamphlet things, but I didn't have much success in that. But I want you to look at the Eucharist in the prayer book, and I want you to go to page 361. Everything we ought to do up through the piece would have been done in the synagogue that Jesus attended. That's all part of Jewish worship. We sing praises, 
we sing, sing psalms, we read scripture, we hear sermons, we think about things, we meditate on things, we thank God for things. The only thing that is really unique about the Christian service is the saying of the creed. That would not have been done in um, the synagogue, but they had their own uh, declarations. Everything there was pretty standard. The thing that was unique in Christian worship is, came in Act 2. Everything from the beginning to the peace is Act 1. Act 2 came from Jesus himself. It's what we do, what he did on the night before he died. What did he do? He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. That's what we call the Holy Communion. Act 2 is made up of four things that Jesus did on the night before he suffered. We will take the bread, it will be brought up in the offertory, we'll set it upon the altar, we'll bless it by saying a prayer, thanking God for the gift of Jesus. Then we'll break the bread and then we'll have communion and then it's over. Now it's that third part I want you to look at. Look at this service, if you will, at 361. You see where it says the great thanksgiving? That's in bold type. Right? And then that's the great blessing. And then we come to the next part, which is on page 364. You see where it says the breaking of the bread? Now, if you look in your bulletin, I don't think it's going to be quite that clear. Let me borrow your bulletin just a minute. Let me just double check this. I don't want to speak out of turn. I want to be informed. And, well, it says, do you see, it doesn't even mention the breaking of the bread. See that? The breaking of the bread is the third thing that Jesus did. And it's so important, it's set apart here in the prayer book. Do you see that? And I want you to notice something else. Right there it says, The celebrant breaks the consecrated bread, capital B. And then what does it say? Let's read it together. A period of silence is kept. Mr. Organist, note that. Because in virtually every church, we break the bread and we go right into the singing, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Why is this noted that there should be a period of silence? What does the breaking of the bread commemorate? What does it mean? This remembers the giving of Jesus' own life. He was broken on the cross. He really and truly died. In a way, the breaking of the bread is as important as anything in the liturgical service. Because it reminds us that Jesus didn't just come teaching us to love each other and be nice and be good citizens. Jesus came to give his life so that we might have new life. The breaking of the bread is set apart in the liturgy precisely so we will have time to think about that. And our attention will be absorbed by Jesus' self-giving. Then we go on to the communion. <clears throat> the four things we do, but the third one is just as important as anything else in that list. That's what I want to drive home for you. You are a priest, and as priests you ought to know what's going on in your own service. We don't just come to church to be refilled. We don't just come to church to receive God's grace. We don't just come to church maybe to be inspired by the sermon. We come to church because we are Christ's priests and we are here to offer something. And now that's what I want to talk about, the practical aspect of this. What are you offering? Well, of course, you're offering your own life. But do you know you cannot come to the Eucharist only to receive? 
You must come bearing a love and a care and a concern for others around you. Last week, I asked you all to pray for my grandson and other young people from the Church of the Incarnation who were in Haiti. Praise be to God, they all came home on Monday. And being teenagers, they didn't realize the real danger they were in, but it was a great relief, and God answered our, our prayers and bring them home safely. <clears throat> but you should do this every week. Before you come to church, like a good priest, you ought to prepare yourself. There is somebody in your life, somebody you know, who needs your prayer. There's somebody who's just suffered a death, someone who's going through a troubled marriage, someone who has a very sick child, someone who's in desperate need. You can probably think of half a dozen, maybe more, in just this moment. It's your job as a priest to bring them with you, not physically, but in your heart and in your mind. And here's what I suggest practically. When we come to that part of the Eucharist, when the bread is raised and just before it's broken, I want you to think of that person, that soul. Maybe it's a family, maybe it's a small group. But be specific and lift them up to God. Offer them up to God. In your mind's eye, see them under Christ, and when that bread is broken, see Christ breaking open his life, showering them with his grace and healing power. It may be a mystical thing to do, but it's a powerful thing to do, and it will focus your praying in a way that maybe you've never experienced before. You are priests. The breaking of the bread is an important part of our liturgy. It's where Jesus broke himself open for us. You offer up your friends and neighbors and family and whoever is in need in that moment of silence. And let Christ minister to them through your intercession. Amen.